In today's interconnected world, technology has become an integral part of our daily lives. Between smartphones and laptops, we rely on technology for communication, entertainment, work, and much more. And while it's clear to see how beneficial technology can be to us, it has also made us more vulnerable to cyber attacks. From simple computer viruses and anti-malware software to complete hacking groups and cybersecurity firms, the digital landscape has proven to be a battleground for those seeking to do harm and those working to protect against it. By now, you've all heard about the massive data breaches where millions of users' information was compromised, or the cases where a company's integral files were held for ransom. But what happens when the target is even bigger? Like an entire city. While it might not be as public, the government struggles from cyber attacks just the same as we do. The only difference is the stakes if they aren't successful in defending them. When they are, you'll never hear about it. But the few times the hackers do make it through, the consequences are dire. Today, we'll be taking a look at these times, when the cyber defenses weren't enough and cities were held for ransom. But before we take a look at these cyber attacks, I'd first like to thank today's video sponsor, Babbel. Learning a second language can broaden your cultural horizons, enhance your career opportunities, and improve your cognitive abilities. But oftentimes, the difficult part is actually learning it. This is where Babbel comes in. Babbel is a language learning app that makes the entire journey of learning a new language much easier. They focus on teaching the most important practical language that you'd actually use in conversation through short 10-minute lessons. I've actually been using the app myself for over six months now, and it's helped me on vacations, while communicating with coworkers, and even just as a conversation starter. Recently, I've been working on their Spanish travel essentials lesson in preparation for an upcoming trip, and it's actually been really helpful. In addition, Babbel offers multiple ways to learn with podcasts, lessons, live classes, and even games to make learning suitable for everyone. Make this year the one where you finally learn that new language you've always wanted to with Babbel. Check them out and get up to 60% off by clicking the link down in the description below or by scanning the QR code on screen. Thanks again to Babbel for sponsoring this video and making this content possible. To actually understand how these cities managed to be held hostage by a group of hackers, we first need to understand what ransomware is. Ransomware is a type of malicious software that encrypts a victim's files and demands payment in exchange for restoring the files. You might be familiar with the kind of ransomware that targets individuals, like the jigsaw virus I showcased in one of my recent videos. But over the past decade, we've seen ransomware hone in on public institutions, like schools, hospitals, and government agencies. The logic behind this targeting is simple. Although there might be a much larger financial incentive to target private companies, a payout only matters if it's actually secured. When dealing with a government system that has a vast amount of sensitive data and operations that cannot be interrupted, the incentive to pay goes up. In addition, plenty of public institutions are known for running on decades-old tech and outdated security philosophies that make them an easy target. This was exactly the case with Atlanta, Georgia in 2018. Despite criticisms of the city's readiness to deal with a cybersecurity breach, the Atlanta government had been dragging their feet on the matter. In January of 2018, this became undeniable when an audit revealed that there were up to 2,000 vulnerabilities in key city systems. Experts were worried, and rightfully so. But still, the government employees carried on as usual because the usual didn't seem to be a problem. Systems could be slow and their usability could be questionable, but without top-level changes, there was little else to do. That was, of course, until one morning on March 22nd, when the usual was disrupted. The attack first became apparent when five major municipal departments quickly found themselves locked out of their computers, unable to use vital systems. As early as the next day, the news was reporting on claims that it seemed to be the Samsam ransomware virus. To most of the employees in most of the city, this didn't mean much. However, this was the same virus that had brought towns like Farmington, New Mexico to a standstill and held files for ransom at the Colorado Department of Transportation. 
but those seemed like smaller cogs in a bigger machine. Atlanta, it was a whole city, a state capital at that. It was the machine. The ransom was set at $52,000 worth of Bitcoin, but Atlanta didn't pay, and so the consequences came. Utility bills couldn't be paid, important legal documents couldn't be accessed, and even a week after the incident, police reports were still being recorded by hand. The judicial system was in chaos, with any court appearances for individuals not currently in custody being indefinitely delayed. Departments that depended on 20 computers now had to make do with whatever laptops the city could cough up. And at Hartsfield Jackson, the busiest airport in the world, Wi-Fi networks were going out. Eventually, more news outlets picked up on the story, and people started to worry that a large-scale data breach had occurred. Early statements from authorities shot this claim down, but would later backtrack and imply that only a small amount of information was taken. The city responded by distributing documents to as many of the 8,000 public employees as possible. All of them stressed a single fact. Do not, under any circumstance, turn on the computers. Four days after the attack began, the mayor would make a statement. I just want to make a point that this is much bigger than a ransomware attack. This really is an attack on our government, which means it's an attack on all of us. No ransom was ever paid by the city of Atlanta, though it's unclear if they even could have. As shortly after the ransom went out, the payment portal was taken offline by the hackers themselves. Among the data lost were police dashcam footage, important legal documents, court information, and even months later, more than a third of the programs used by the city were still disabled or offline altogether. There was at least some closure when it came to the attackers themselves though, with two Iranian hackers, part of the Sam Sam group, indicted for the attack. But even with that, a major US city had proven itself out of its element in the world of cybersecurity. Above all else, that was what concerned security experts, that this successful attack would embolden cyber criminals and encourage more hacks on large cities. Those fears would prove to be fair. Only a year after the Atlanta incident, the city of Baltimore would be locked by a variant of the ransomware called Robinhood. The ransom was set at 13 bitcoins or $76,000 at the time. Once again, on the low end, to incite prompt payment. An initial ransom note drew a deadline of four days in the sand. If the city did not comply, the price would steadily rise until the hackers would delete any and all the data they had at day 10. At this point, some of you might be thinking that they should just pay the ransom to avoid another case like Atlanta, but that isn't exactly true. Paying the ransom is something that should only ever be done if absolutely necessary, as once you pay it, the hackers most likely won't give your files back, and it also encourages the act of ransomware attacks by awarding them with compensation. Baltimore stuck to this principle and didn't pay, and so again, the consequences came. Although specifics are hard to find, the scope of this attack seemed to affect considerably more institutions and services, including the Baltimore Police Department, the Department of Transportation, the Animal Rescue and Care Shelter, tax payment services, housing transactions, and much more. Once again, the city was forced to resort to pen and paper, try and keep core services up and running while slowly getting their systems back online. It ended up taking almost two weeks before some sense of normalcy returned to Baltimore. But the entire process lasted all the way until September, over four months later. Even now, the city is not fully recovered, with the real estate market taking a dip from housing transactions being disabled and a still growing cost of more than $18 million pledged for restoration efforts. In the end, many couldn't help but think the city would have just been better off paying the ransom. In the aftermath of these attacks, both cities were left in a strange place, but their failings could be a wake up call to others as we become more and more reliant on technology. The only real way to mitigate these attacks is by implementing top-level security systems and training. If we don't, the consequences will just keep coming. Take an earlier ransomware attack of the Baltimore Police Department where 911 emergency response systems were disrupted for an entire weekend. 
It points to dangerous possibilities. Gas and heating systems could be turned off in deep winters, or medical histories could become inaccessible at critical moments. Public health could lose data tracking diseases, and breaches in the integrity of water and power infrastructure could cause immense damage. Infinite possibilities with infinite consequences, and it just might be coming to a city near you. Thanks for watching.